Has anybody declared to interest? Anybody? None. Item two is urgent business. I am not aware of any. And item three, I'm dependent on the wiki and she's out of uh, room at the moment. So give me one minute, please. One second. Item three, apologies. Sorry, Chair. Apologies for absence uh, from Councillor Hibberin, Councillor Weatherby, and Councillor Sanders should be deputising, and Councillor Brady, Brady and Councillor Cannon Brace Girdle. Thank you, Vicky. Item four, minutes of previous meeting. Can somebody move these as a correct, correct record? Move. Second. Put somebody seconding. Yeah, second. Thank you. Thank you. Item five: proposed a committee work program for 2020, 2020 and 2021. I'll hand you over to uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Thank you, Chair. Um, we have circulated a report which has got the proposed items for the forthcoming year. Um, this is obviously flexible and if members have any other suggestions throughout the year, they can be added. It's just for, for members to ag agree now. Thank you. Move it. Thank you. Item six, staying safe demand management strategy. Uh, I'll hand you over to Bernie Brown. Thank you, Chair. Um, good evening, councillors. We put um, some slides together to summarise the complexity of the current demand uh, management strategy. Uh, across the Stay and Safe for, for Children's and Ian is going to walk through those slides with you. Um, I think one of the things that when we, we're facing the most critical pressure is, is obviously uh, a, a continued increase of the number of looked after children and um, a, a pressure on placements and I'm unsure but hopeful that colleagues from um, the Bolton News have dialed into this um, scrutiny presentation this evening because I think that as a council um, we would like them to consider doing a positive profile on recruitment of foster carers in Bolton following this presentation and I would welcome some contact to myself from, from the paper um, so that we can progress a, a dialogue about how we can engage with uh, foster carers um, and sorry the community uh, and encourage uh, an interest in, in foster carers and I would welcome a, a views from councillors uh, if you have um, proposals when Ian's finished his his slides around how we might engage members of your own um, community in, in thinking about foster care as, as a career given the pressures that we're under but I'm going to hold hand, hand over to Ian um, to summarise um, the, the scale of um, the, the pressures that we're facing, um, some of some of which have been kind of linked to to COVID, but some are are, are linked to broader challenges uh, around poverty um, and and deprivation that continue to increase and place pressure on us. So, Ian, over to you. Ian, your microphone's muted. A great start. Um, yeah, evening, councillors. Uh, my name's Ian Walker, Assistant Director for Stay and Safe. Uh, and as Bernie was referencing previously, I think managing the demand placed on any social care organisation 
is a big challenge at the best of times. I think managing the demand on the system in the context of COVID-19 is especially challenging um, given the additional pressures that the families within Bolton have been experiencing over the course of the past five months. However, hopefully the, the presentation will give the appropriate reassurance that we do have uh, a robust plan in place to effectively manage the, the ongoing demands on the system. So if we move to the first or the next slide, please. So um, within the referral and assessment service, we, which is colloquially termed as the front door, the point at which contacts are initially received from referring agencies and from families, um, we know we can see that the contacts are back now at pre-COVID levels around um, 175 to 185 per week. As anticipated immediately post COVID and post lockdown, those, those referrals did, those contacts did uh, drop significantly, but over the weeks they, they've climbed back um, to where they were pre-COVID. Um, this is uh, a bit of an anxiety for, for us going forward because um, the referrals from schools has only been at around 0 to 15 percent of, of previous levels uh, and yet we know that schools are our second largest referring agency after the police. So come uh, September when the schools reopen we anticipate that our contacts uh, to the front door will, will exceed or likely to exceed where they were uh, pre-Covid um, back, in, back in March. Um, further to this, um, the, the contacts and referrals that we're receiving uh, demonstrate extremely high levels of complexity uh, and that results in uh, high numbers of strategy meetings to consider whether children have reached the threshold of significant harm which would warrant a uh, child protection investigation. Um, as stated, you know, the, 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 these pressures are likely to increase further um, when the schools reopen and should there be a, a second wave of, of COVID infections as, as most of the, 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 uh, the, the health advisors seem to be uh, anticipating. Um, as a result of, of those increased referrals, the numbers of children subject of child, um, child and need plans has increased by 8% on where it was before. Um, and the, um, the caseload levels of, uh, of social workers are also experiencing um, an increase. Um, although they remain manageable at present, they are certainly at the high end of the, man the manageable scale. And next slide, please. So what are we doing to address those demands? Well, the key strategy will be the launch of our early help service uh, in autumn. Uh, and the early help will be positioned before the front door with, with four high level measures um, set down as targets for them to reduce demand on the social care system. The first measure will be an earlier identification of need, creating that system wide ability to respond across all partner agencies, schools and health, for example. Uh, and that will ensure that the responses are more timely to those families. Uh, the improved partnership working uh, will be designed to divert families from that social care pathway of, of referral to child in need, to child protection, to pre proceedings, to care proceedings, to looked after children. Um, so hopefully we will be able to divide, uh, divert more of those families from that pathway through the system. There will be increased capacity for step down cases from social care intervention. Um, into the early help model, which will create capacity amongst the social workers force. And there should be an associated reduction in re-referral rates because of that ongoing support post social work interventions. There will also be the implementation of the early help access points, which should further impact on reducing the inappropriate referrals to social care and reduce the no further action rates. Next slide, please. Um, what we have experienced um, within the service over the course of the, of the past five months is a significant increase in the numbers of children subject to child protection plans. And we've done a, a real deep dive audit into the uh, underlying causes for that increase. And we identified there were five um, key 
issues that were causing the increase in, in children subject to those plans. Um, first, the first issue was that most of the key components of the plan hadn't been completed in full, and there was a variety of reasons for that. But um, one of the reasons was the, the fact that social workers, uh, for obvious reasons, haven't been able to cross thresholds um, into, to go into people's houses um, to, to implement compo individual components of those plans. Um, as a result of that, um, a lot of the direct work was unable to be completed with the young people and with the parents. Uh, that in turn led to an increase in professional concerns um, as a direct cause of lockdown. Um, further to that, um, there's been limited or no access to all of the support agencies that have ordinarily constituted part of the child protection plan. So, so for example, there have been uh, very limited parenting courses available, uh, a limited access to mediation and, and to the voluntary sector, such as inner strength and to the, the drugs and alcohol support services as well. And as a result of that, individual components of plans haven't been able to be completed. And finally, there's been a certain degree of professional anxiety simply because uh, those vulnerable children have been less visible to agencies. Obviously, um, with the schools closing down, um, one of those almost daily accesses of professionals to, to children's subject of plans has been taken away and that has served to increase professional anxiety um, and has, has been an inhibitor in enabling uh, uh, child protection case conference reviews to agree that the removal of children from those plans has been appropriate. Next slide, please. So what are we doing to address those risks? Well, we are going to dedicate, or we are in the process of de dedicating some social work resource to formulate a focused child protection strategy. So we, we, we're looking at those families who we feel are appropriate or the closest to having their plan removed because they're, they're working with as well. Uh, and going in and working directly with those families to address uh, the, the shortfall in the completion of the plans in a, in a focused way um, to hopefully give uh, the child protection case conferences greater confidence in the, in the suggestion or the recommendation that those plans be ended. We'll also be having dedicated IRO and child protection case conference chairs to support and facilitate uh, those timely reviews and to drive those plans into completion. Uh, we are going to have some focused increased access to family homes, obviously subject of appropriate risk assessments uh, and continued availability of PPE. Um, and the overall aim of that will be to better manage the number of those children subject to child protection plans. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of the next stage in the social care pathway, um, the, the numbers of looked after children. So far within Bolton, um, I think we have managed uh, the, the numbers of looked after ch children reasonably well within the context of COVID-19 and pending obviously the ripple effect of the increased referrals, the increased child in need, the increased child protection plans. Um, and uh, we are certainly um, at the at the top end of the league, if you would like to term it that way, in terms of managing our numbers of looked after children as compared to um, our our peers in the in the GM region. Um, so the the numbers of looked after children will continue to fluctuate fluctuate somewhere between 620 uh, and 640. But of those children, we know that there are 77 children currently subject of care orders living at home. Um, there are also 18 children already living with their adoptive parents and 104 living with family and friends carers, 41 of those who have been long term matched and 51 children voluntarily accommodated by Section 20 of the of the of the Children Act. Um, so they are all opportunities for for reviewing the care plan and supporting those children into more appropriate forms of permanence. Um, the risk is that we also know that half of our current care proceedings are, are already over the, the, 20, the 26 week target time scale are set down by, by the government. Uh, and the reasons that for that are also directly related to COVID in terms of lack of court timetabling and availability uh, of courts. So next slide, please. 
So um, in terms of uh, managing uh, the, the numbers of looked after children, we have already reopened Trackside, which is um, our, our short breaks provision for, for children with uh, complex health needs. And we are also reopening our short breaks provision to reduce the, the pressure on families. One of the things we had to do at the start of COVID was to, um, to, to close down our short breaks provision because of the additional health vulnerabilities of those children. Had any of those children contracted, contacted, uh, contracted COVID-19, then they would be vulnerable to be becoming significantly and severely ill. So for the, for the health needs of those children, we ended our short, short breaks provision. Um, obviously, we didn't know how long lockdown was going to last at that time. And what we have noticed is that the pressure on parents who have children with disabilities or additional health needs um, have struggled to manage without that short breaks provision. As a result of that, we are on a planned and incremental basis, gradually opening the short breaks provision to provide that additional um, support to those families. Um, we are uh, about to open our uh, adolescent resource centre, our edge of care provision for uh, teenagers who are uh, at risk of becoming estranged from their birth families uh, and at risk of having their parents request and come into our care. Uh, so the, the Adolescent Resource Centre uh, is designed to provide outreach, but also planned and booked respite for adolescents um, to enable them to continue living in the family home on an ongoing basis. Very focused and very time limited interventions of 12 weeks whereby we get in, we do the work, we support the families and then we uh, we withdraw and enable them to continue uh, to, to manage uh, more successfully on their own. Um, we're also implementing the, the lack reduction strategy, like, like I referred to in the previous slide. We've reviewed every single care plan for all 600 plus of our children and identified um, which of those children we think we can appropriately support out of the looked after system and into more appropriate permanent care arrangements. Um, at the minute, we have 94 of those children with a confirmed plan and a confirmed time scale for the discharge of those care orders, with another 38 children with a confirmed plan, but no confirmed time scale for the discharge of the care orders. So um, the, 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 those 98 plans are due for completion by the end of the financial year. Uh, and not only will that benefit the young people by giving them more appropriate forms of permanence outside of the looked after system, but it should also bring down the numbers of our overall looked after children. Um, we're also in the middle of reviewing our sufficiency strategy, which is a statutory obligation on all local authorities um, so that we can evidence that we can better meet the placement needs uh, of all of our looked after children over the course of the next three years. Next slide, please. Um, so in terms of um, um, placement costs, um, our, our teenagers, um, are, are, um, we, have, we have a significant number of teenagers who are placed in out of authority residential placements. Um, uh, and, and two things then, obviously that brings significant financial pressures, uh, but it also um, brings uh, challenges for those young people because we know that at the age of 16, 17, uh, most of those young people um, who still review Bolton as their hometown um, start to drift back home. So we, we can manage that on a more planned basis. We can, we can better ensure that those moves back to their hometown are more successful to them and we can help them support them into a successful transition into adulthood. So, Part of the plan for the step down process is just to accelerate that move to semi independence within the Bolton Borough um, for the 21, 16 and 17 year olds who are currently placed out of the borough. Um, and as I said, it will give them benefits. Uh, it will be a smooth transition rather than it one significant step uh, and bring with it significant cost savings. Um, within that, we have got dedicated placements at the supported lodging provision within Bolton to facilitate those step down, pl step down plans. Uh, and we're also um, in embarking in, a, in what I think is a really exciting project in partnership with Bolton at Home, 
uh, working uh, with them to identify six to eight supported tenancies in, in some of the new build provision that they're working on uh, it, it, to enable those young people to move into what I what I would view to be highly aspirational but also highly affordable tenancies for young people. Uh, the concept being that for a period of time Bolton will bequeath those tenancies to to us uh, while we make sure that those young people can can become successful tenants uh, and when they've undertaken their tenancy support program and evidence their competence then we will sign those tenancies over to the young people and draw down another tenancy from Bolton at home and start the program again on a rolling project. Uh, I'm really excited about the, the, the whole project and I think it's it, it's it's got great potential uh, for proving the outcomes for for our young people. And then the final aspect of the of the plan is a more imaginative um, use of, of foster placement referral forms, including um, day in the life narratives and DVDs of specific young people whereby they have the opportunity to talk about their homes, hopes and fears and their wishes for for a, a family based environment. And I think one or two elected members have already seen um, a couple of the examples of the of the DVDs that we have shared with the independent uh, fostering providers. Uh, we've un already undertaken the process for two young people for whom we were finding it really difficult to, to identify foster carers. And as a result of this fairly innovative approach, we managed to secure foster placements for both of them. So it's a really good news story. Next slide, please. Um, and and um, although the, the independent fostering sector is a key component of our sufficiency strategy, obviously we would rather um, that, it, that our children were raised uh, within our own foster care provision. So foster care recruitment is going to be a key component of, of this um, demand management strategy. Um, cost is an issue because as you can see, our foster carers cost approximately half what the independent fostering agency um, foster placements cost. And um, obviously because we're a not-for-profit non, not organisation, whereas the IFAs um, do have uh, a business plan where profit is a factor. But more than that, we know from our own performance reports that pl placement stability is more likely to be achieved for our children where they're raised within our foster care provision than when they are raised uh, within the independent fostering agency provision. Um, and we also know that placement stability is one of the key predicators for successful outcomes for our looked after children. Hence the importance of boosting the numbers of our in-house foster carers. At present, we have 181 mainstream foster carers and 131 family and friends foster carers. Um, like all local authorities, we're um, facing a, a bit of a demographic time bomb because a lot of our foster carers are, are relatively uh, advanced in age, and so the numbers of retirements in the coming years are going to are going to grow. However, um, our revised recruitment process is, is robust and strong, um, and and since the first of April, uh, we've uh, we've had 167 inquiry leads which has led to 11 new carers currently in the process of assessment. Uh, because of our revised process, which I'm going to walk you through, um, our inquiry leads have increased by 48% this financial year on last year, and our registrations of interest have increased by 22% as compared to the same period uh, 12 months ago. Uh, and you can see from the, uh, the graph at the bottom of that slide, the huge spike in um, in expressions of interest and the resulting um, the resulting increase in registrations of interest um, since we revised our uh, our marketing processes. So next slide, please. Um, so um, how come how how do people inquire now? What we didn't have within Bolton was was a really strong um, a strong footprint on social social media uh, and we know that most people nowadays get their information through through the internet so um, now as of as of this year 61% uh, of the inquiry leads come through face Facebook and 22% of the registrations of interest come the same through the same route 
and a further 28% through our revised fostering website form and 56% of the registrations of interest come through that way. Um, we, uh, so the, our, our, social, our social media presence is much stronger. Um, we are still a little laid, a little way down on the on the league table when you Google fostering in, in Bolton as compared to the independent fostering sector for my liking. Um, but um, hopefully with uh, as our social media presence grows, we'll climb up that league table and, and hopefully aim to be the, the first uh, site on the on the search engine when you Google fostering in Bolton. Next slide, please. This is just a little bit of the of the analytics so you can see how forensic we are now in our marketing of our fostering provision. Uh, we can identify um, the number of web page page visits. We can identify how long individual users stay on which page so we know what interests them. Is it the is it the allowances or is it the the uh, the additional benefits? Um, or is it kind of the, the more altruistic um, benefits to be to be gained from from fostering uh, of which there are of which there are many. Um, so that's just kind of a, a bit of a, a, um, a graph of the analytics that we then use to follow up with individual people who log on to the website uh, to keep them warm and to keep their interest in, in fostering for Bolton. Next slide, please. So the digital market marketing campaign in terms of the impact um, 7754 clicks, which is increased on month on month. The click through rate, which is the the number of people who log on to the first page and actually work their way through every single page uh, is 8%, which is way, way, way above the, the benchmark of, of less than 2% um, that the, the, the fostering industry is evidencing on a national basis. So we know that when people do click on our website is sufficiently interested to hold that interest right the way through. Um, the cost per click currently costing around £3.60, but as more people click, um, the, the cost of that will decrease month on month. Um, and, and that ensures that we are only bidding the necessary, necessary amount to generate leads. And as you can see, 75% people click using their, their, own, their, own mobile, their own mobiles. Um, so uh, and then on Facebook, you can see the reach that, that the number of people who have seen the ads, which is a huge number, leading to the uh, 3000 plus clicks um, and the, the link clicks where people go th directly through to the website. Again, it's just important for us to, to make sure that we're directing uh, our information uh, to the right uh, to the right resources to give us the best chance of recruiting the most foster carers that we possibly can. Next slide, please. Uh, and there's, you know, we, we, we then monitor every single contact that we have either in person or through through the social media or through the website. Um, and so far, you know, we have um, not yet quite halfway through the, the financial year. We already have four new foster families approved a further five in the midst of assessment and a further 11 um, waiting to undertake their training after which they will initiate their assessment. So if you add in that together, that's 23, sorry, that's 20 um, new prospective new foster families and the target for the whole financial year uh, is 23 new foster families. Uh, there are 12 further uh, people on hold. Primarily that has to be it has to be said that's due to COVID-19 um, obviously people not wanting to undertake direct um, family uh, home visits from social workers because of lockdown uh, and um, um, self, self social distancing and, and self isolation. But as lockdowns lifting, we will be re-engaging with those 12 families uh, and instigating the, the assessment process. So we are in a strong position to to uh, overcome or certainly surpass the target of 23 new faster families that was that was set at the start of the financial year. Next slide, please. So the next steps, uh, we want to continue the media campaign, the digi digital marketing campaign um, for the nine months of the year. 
um, and we will be taking advantage of Bolton FM's really good offer of the complimentary radio campaign offer. Um, we want to develop new design and branding and produce new marketing collateral to make us more competitive with the private sector uh, and to better use Bolton, uh, Bolton Council skills and resources, our PR, PR department, the internal channels and our marketing department. Um, we need to develop our community outreach approach to develop awareness raising and behaviour changing um, and especially engaging with certain aspects of the local community that we haven't really engaged with so far to change their attitudes and perceptions, um, especially amongst the target groups, the LGBT groups, um, the BAME community, uh, the local mosques, um, just to engage and increase the number of our foster carers from, from those groups of, of the Bolton community so that we can then provide a better match for, for our looked after young people in terms of, of their own identity. Um, we need to really use um, our, our own foster carers more um, to, to, to get out and to get, get them telling the story and to get them providing the content uh, to provide case studies and representation. We know that one of our strongest tools is word of mouth uh, and our foster carers, they obviously must be getting something out of being a foster carer um, to, to continue to offer that service. So we need to better use their skills and experience to get that story out to the local community. And finally, you know, dare I say it, we need to use the extensive networks already established by yourselves as elected members. You probably have more community engagement than, than, than most people uh, uh, within the council. So, you know, with, with your cooperation and collaboration, we want to utilise your expertise and your contacts to get the story and the message out into the local community uh, and, and to recruit more foster carers for ourselves within, within Bolton. So that's the end of the presentation. I am more than happy to take any questions or queries from anybody about any aspect of the demand management strategy. Thank you. Councillor, your microphone's muted. Uh, before I open this up for question, I want to bring in Councillor Ishmael, who wanted to uh, speak on uh, work programs, and she also wants to speak on this pr presentation. So, Councillor Ishmael. Thank you, Chair. In relation to the work programme, I would like to request that plea and youth provision be added to the work programme. I did raise this as an issue at the exec members um, meeting and thank you very much, Bernie, for the response that you sent through in relation to this. So I'd like to add it to the work programme, please. I have noticed that you've uh, indicated you want to speak, so perhaps you can add some further detail there. Ian, thank you very much for your presentation. Very informative, very detailed. I had a question in relation to the timing in relation to the foster programme itself. So I noticed a foster parent put a request in, uh, an expression of interest in April 19 and was approved in, I think it was May 20. This is in relation to the chart that you posted on there. So pre-COVID, what was the typical time frame in terms of approval? And now during COVID, what's the typical time frame in terms of approval and how long does the training typically take, please? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, the, 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 the usual time scale um, is six to eight months, which from my perspective is too long. Um, and we haven't previously performance managed the, the recruitment process. However, we now have um, the recruitment pipeline uh, and performance management tool. Uh, and the target set for the team is to manage the process from a registration of interest through to an approval panel within four months. And if we need more panels to facilitate that, then, then, then we will do that. Um, so, so four months will be the revised target for the recruitment team to support families through from initial registration of interest through to approval. Um, currently, um, we're, we're hitting the six to eight month timescale. Um, in terms of training, you know, that, that can be a barrier um, and, and slow the process down. But I think there's an opportunity to work more collaboratively across the GM region and actually share that because we all run the same training program because it's a, a it's um it, it is a, a 
BAF, British Association of Adoption and Foster and Training Programme, uh, there's an opportunity then to work more collaboratively with GM partners so that we can actually offer more timely training um, to those to those prospective foster carers across the GM region. Thank you, Chair. I had a follow up question, uh, Ian, if I may. In relation to fostering itself, how do we compare with the rest of GM in terms of the number of children placed in with foster carers? as opposed to with the independent fostering agencies? Um, I, I couldn't um, give you those figures off the top of my head, but if you uh, give me a couple of days, I'll do the research and I will come back to you. Um, it's not something that we, um, that's generally reported to my knowledge in, in the, the GM wide report, but I will I will speak to my some of my AD colleagues to see how they manage um, and, and come back to you if that's okay. Thank you. Yeah, muted Councillor Iqbal. Sorry about that. Councillor Murray wanted to speak, so I'll bring in Councillor Murray. Thank you, Chair. Um, can I just add that besides staff being anxious about not being able to uh, do their visits to uh, vulnerable children, the uh, elected members have also been quite uh, anxious as well. Um, I have a few questions, but I don't want to hog, so I'll ask the first question um, and see what everybody else is doing. Um, can you tell us the average caseload for a social worker um, before COVID and maybe after, please. I, I can do it. Yeah. Uh, prior to COVID, we were averaging somewhere in the region of, um, well, it's around about the low 20s, 20 to 23. Uh, we're now up into the high 20s, uh, 28, 29. We have a, uh, a small number of social workers who, who have caseloads over 30, um, but once they reach that level, there's a focused management intervention program to support those caseloads come back down. Um, sometimes it's just a matter of, of, of process and getting cases closed. Um, so at the minute, like I said, it, it's 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 high end of manageable, um, but hopefully with this this um, overarching demand management strategy, um, um, th those caseloads shouldn't shouldn't increase any further and, and should in fact come down over the course of the coming months. Can I be cheeky and just get another one in before somebody else comes in about I'm really glad you've got Avondale open. Um, what about uh, sorry, you've got Trackside open. What about um, Avondale and what about um, the Tumor home or have we not got the Tumor home now? Thank you. No, I don't think we have that home anymore. In respect of Avondale, um, it will be reopening there just needs to be some building work completed on it. Um, and once that building work is completed, then Avondale will be back up and running and offering short breaks provision. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Murray. Uh, we have uh, Councillor Debbie Newell as indicator to speak. Councillor Newell. Thank you, Chair. Um, Ian, uh, thanks for the presentation. It was really interesting. Um, oh, I've better put the camera on so you can see who I am. There you go. Um, yeah, it was really interesting. You mentioned supported lodging. I wonder, could you tell us a little bit more about that? Is it the same as supported living or obviously supported living for younger people? Could you just tell us a bit more about it, please? Yeah, supported lodging, it's a provision where it's kind of a, um, a halfway step uh, between living in in a, in a children's home and living independently. So, you know, the, these are um, young people approaching adulthood. And um, so they are facilitated a, a, a certain amount, a greater degree of freedoms and flexibilities. And um, they do the, their own, uh, they, they do a lot of their own care. So they, they are supported to 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 cook their own meals, to the, do their own washing and cleaning, all of the household chores, the budgeting, but also more importantly, supported into uh, employment, education and training opportunities within Bolton as well. 
um, but there are staff available 24-7 to support them. So it's kind of a, a halfway house type scenario, if you like, um, because I think, you know, for to expect children to come out of children's homes, very structured environment, group living where even a lot of your social life might be organised for you, to then expect them to step straight into so pure independence is, is a big ask for anybody, never mind young people coming out of the looked after care system. So it is a, a graduated process um, over the course of, of a number of months um, to, to admit, enable those people then to, to take the next step towards independence uh, and those, those hopefully those supported tenancies I talked about in the presentation as well. Thank you. We have a really good arrangement with some of the providers uh, and th their outcomes really are strong within Bolton. I've got to say I've only been in, in Bolton well, six months now. It seems seems like an awfully long time, but I've got to say one of the things that one of the things of many that's impressed me about Bolton is, is the provision for, for care leavers is, is really varied uh, and really broad so that we can actually um, we can actually tailor make or we can we can um, better match the needs of the young people to the in, in individual providers. Uh, and I think that's probably why the, the outcomes for our care leaves are quite relatively strong. Thank, Thank you, you. Uh, Councillor Newell. Um, the director has, a, Bernie Brown has indicated to speak, so Bernie. Thank you, Chair. Um, just wanted to um, check with Councillor Ishmael um, if she could email me just the detail on which element of youth and play she wants as part of the scrutiny. I, I think I, I, I think I have a sense, but it would just be good to get some clarity so that when we do the presentation for scrutiny, we hit the right elements of um, the, the presentation. The presentation. So if Councillor Ishmael would be happy to email me, Chair, and then we can we can make sure we cover off the, the key elements. And then the second point, um, I just wanted to, to pick up on a comment that Ian made around uh, collaboration with Greater Manchester. I think in relation to looked after children and particularly fostering recruitment, we will be um, sharing more information about greater collaboration between the authorities for all of the reasons that, that Ian has outlined, that we are actually fishing in the same pond to recruit carers and it would be good to collaborate on certain elements of our assessment and our training programmes and we're doing some work on uh, an outline um, to position in relation to that, um, which hopefully will be beneficial to our young people in Bolton. Councillor Ishmael, are you OK with that? Yes, thank you, Chair. I'll, thank I'll you. email Bernie. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Heslop has indicated to speak. Councillor Heslop. Thank you, Chair. Um, Ian, I want to stay focused on uh, what Councillor Newall was saying um, relating to supported lodging. And then the next bit, which was going on to the semi-independent accommodation or initiative through Bolton at home. Now, the supported lodging thing, you, you said you've got so you're working in some partnership uh, partnerships with some really good companies. Um, could that not be done in-house? Um, with the council, given the fact that a lot of the private stuff, as you previously mentioned, uh, you mentioned the um, IFA versus, you know, um, our own fosterers being twice the cost. I'm wondering whether there would be a cost saving there. Uh, and the second bit was really in relation to the semi independence living, where I presume these two are linked, but the semi independence living, can you confirm is it specific? projects, specific geographical areas, or whether it's right across the borough, this initiative with Bolton at home with their properties. OK, thank you. Yeah, in, in respect of the, the supported uh, accommodation, um, it, it is a very cost effective um, um, process. Um, and, and I think the, the cost of, of, you know, securing a property, staffing it up uh, and, and um, Running a um, such a provision from scratch would be would be cost prohibitive. Um, it, it is cost effective, uh, and, and I'm speaking um, with, with some experience of, of, of leaving care 
um, provisions uh, over the years. Um, and, and the, you know, if the quality of service uh, w was a concern uh, and the costs were high, then it would be something that, that we, we would consider. But as I stated, the outcomes achieved are good uh, and the costs are reasonable. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm, I'm content for the time being to, to continue with the provision as it is. In terms of the, the Bolton at home provision, um, it, it, it is going to be very much young person um, led. So um, Bolton at home have a range of properties uh, and new build, um, new build properties across the whole of the, the Bolton area. Um, and, and what we don't want to do is to create a, a kind of a, a, for want of a better phrase, a care leave ghetto, uh, which may then become um, a, a, a bit of a magnet for, for, for negative influences in the community. So it will be very much dependent and guided by where the young people themselves want to live. Uh, they may want, you know, they may come from a particular area of Bolton uh, and want to return there, or they may want to be closer to the, the town centre for access to college or work opportunities. But we will be very much guided by, by the young people's own expressed uh, wishes and interests, because obviously the intention is that this will become their home for, 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 for some time to come. Um, so obviously we, we need it to be in the most appropriate place to their needs and to, and to their own personal circumstances. I hope that answered your 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 question. Are you okay with that, Paul? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's good. Thank you very much for that. Uh, okay. Ian, um, just, just the other point is, uh, uh, I will, of course, be responding to the email. Thank you for your email recently uh, in relation to a, a, a related issue, but I will obviously get him back to you on that and may um, speak about another issue uh, later on. Thank you. OK, lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Haslop. Uh, Councillor Murray has indicated to speak. Uh, Councillor Murray? Thank you. I was just uh, wondering if Bernie was wanting to come in about that last one. Uh, so I'll, I'll defer it to Bernie and then I'll come back in. OK. OK, Thanks. so I'll bring in uh, Bernie. Thank you, Councillor Murray. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to make the point um, that our commitment to um, our care leavers is really critical um, and the diversity of housing support in all of the communities in Bolton is incredibly important and so Ian and I would welcome your your input and contribution into supporting our young people to feel like they can one stay in Bolton or for children who've been looked out looked after out of authority that they can return to Bolton without prejudice um, I think one of the one of the challenges for us is that young people who've been in care have have often a range of issues with um, family um, with with um, mental health issues, emotional well-being, access to education and employment, and access to good quality housing. This scheme, this collaboration, this partnership with Bolton at Home allows us to provide really good accommodation in in a variety of places in communities where children have grown up and where you are all representatives. And I think it's really important that we allow those children to feel included and embraced in those communities that they belong to. So if you're picking up any issues about um, increased antisocial behaviour or challenges or people making comments about young people returning to their home areas, it would be helpful for us to, to engage in conversations with communities about that so that we can ensure that children um, don't receive even more disadvantage um, because they're not welcomed by the community or indeed they're misunderstood by the community. So I, I think it, it's incumbent upon all of us to, to keep this dialogue alive about how committed we can be to investing in the future of, of Bolton's children who unfortunately have spent a period of their lives in, in the care of the local authority. Councillor Murray, do you want to come back in? Yes, thank you. Um, just looking on the recruitment tracker and then the training, I think I think that is a, a quite a good um, a picture to look forward to while we're having a pandemic. 
but uh, I'm not sure about the clause at the end. I might have missed that. But um, have we got a percentage of um, carers that start the training, uh, but then feel it isn't for them? Is it, I presume it's quite low because of the way that it's staggered in, but it'd be interesting to know. Yeah, well, once the, um, the because the, the, you know, the training is obviously resource expensive, so um, once um, applicants have accessed the training, we are um, as confident as we can be that they are going to progress to panel for approval. Um, what we do at the early stages is is um, almost counsel people out of fostering because um, you know we need people who are committed yeah. because the last thing our young people need is for somebody to start fostering then after a month or two decide it's not for them uh, and resign and then we have to move the young person with all of the disruption to their lives that that will bring and um, so it's in the early stages when the after the registration of interest where they are visited by the, the recruitment social workers uh, and given a an honest picture of, of the challenges but also the, the immense rewards to be gained from the fostering role so that we can be confident that only the people with the, the requisite resilience um, and commitment and sense of humour um, for the role actually progress through to the to the training program. Um, we you know any if if we um, if if we hit uh, a thirteen percent conversion rate to from registration of interest to approval, then we are we are top end on the national scale um, as compared to all of the other local authorities in the country. So that that's our target, thirteen percent from registration of interest to approval. Um, but you know, just emphasise the big. There, there are some of our foster carers have been fostering for years and years, and have fostered dozens and dozens of children. So there are clearly significant uh, rewards to be gained from the role. Um, my my own my sister, my own sister is a foster carer. Um, so you know, speaking from a personal as a, as well as a professional interest, uh, I can vouch for the rewards that they get out of it, but also the significant impact that they have on the lives of, of the most vulnerable children in our society. Lovely. And while while we're, we were going on about um, marketing ourselves, do we still put um, little inquiry slips in the pay envelopes of our staff in the town hall? Because I used to think that was a real good move and a bit sneaky. Um, I, I'm not aware that we do. Um, um, it's something to reconsider, but I, I think the, like I said, the most people get their information from from the internet and social media these days, and I think that is certainly seem to be having uh, a, a more marked impact on the, on increasing the, the levels of response to uh, to to uh, request for for foster carers than any other um, mechanism. That we that we've utilised in in previous campaigns, there's still scope for that you know that direct reach out, that direct access. Um, but I think you know we we really wanted to get the the marketing campaign up and running, and and having an impact. So that's where we focused um, the um, we focused our our energies over the course of the past few months. So long as it's considered, I think uh, if we leave every avenue open, because we have had uh, staff in the past actually give the jobs up um, just to foster for us. It's been uh, some of them have been brilliant. Thanks, Ian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. OK, thank you, Councillor Murray. Ian, before I let you go, uh, I've had a request from some members and it's from myself as well. Is it possible when uh, reports are being written, you know, these abbreviations, if uh, we have some sort of a glossary so people can understand uh, more easily? Yes, yes, certainly. I will, I will try and do that. Um, yeah, I'll provide that and I'll try. Uh, I thought I had done and it might just be a bit of version control in my uh, in my presentation, but I try and uh, uh, first time I use the an acronym it is to actually then in brackets spell out what it means for future reference but i will i will try and, and, and compile for elected members generally i think it would be useful um you know 
all professions love their jargon and, and social work probably as much as anybody. So I think elected members would find it useful if, if we had a, a jargon busting guide for them for future reference in any presentation that or, or any report that's being presented uh, to to any council um, uh, uh, body or, or, or meeting. Thank you very much. That's very much appreciated. And thank you very much for your very comprehensive report. Um, Brad, we move on to item seven, which is COVID-19 update verbal. Uh, I believe Paul Rankin is taking this, Paul. Oh, thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, uh, just following on from conversations last time and the update at the last meeting, um, uh, the update from um, the COVID side of things in our department, um, Ian's obviously given some context around COVID and the situation with children's social care. Um, a, a lot of the other work has been focused on education and, and getting things right for uh, September. Um, there has been uh, guidance that we've issued on the Council's website, uh, which uh, sets out um, for parents um, what, what the position is uh, ahead of returning uh, to school in September. And that it gives a, a link to information on attendance, school uniform, uh, free school meals, travel, and, and what to do with earlier settings as well. Um, uh, schools are, we've been working with school leaders uh, to understand where schools are up to in terms of preparing for September. They've been updating their risk assessments uh, and have been uh, putting lots of controls in place to ensure that it's safe for um, children to return to school from the start of term, uh, which uh, in Bolton is for more schools is the 7th of September. Um, so again, we're working uh, with our schools. We're running a number of webinars with our public health colleagues uh, to update them on current positions and uh, make sure they're prepared, ready for um, that start of term. So uh, happy to take any, any questions on that and, and that position as it stands. Any questions, members? No, thank you, Paul. We move on to item eight, which is members business. Members question, uh, have we got any? I've been told that we have none. Uh, 8B is extracts of a decision made by executive member for children's services held on 16th of June, 8th of July and 17th of August 2020 and closed. Uh, these are for noting any questions regarding these. No. Thank you very much. Uh, the next uh, meeting is on the 19th of October. If members can mark their diaries and uh, can I thank everybody for attendance and their contribution. And uh, I declare that meeting is closed. Thank you. Thank you, Chair.